Today we'll be hearing from Anna Hennels, and she'll be talking about modern monetary theory and its critics and its relationship to other theories of, of money. Uh, and Anna will be talking for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. So please welcome Anna. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> um, hi, first of all, I'm very grateful for Paper Zero to give us this platform. I think it's a great uh, thing. Thanks, Ida, for inviting me. Uh, just to get a sense of the audience, which uh, faculties are people from? Who is from the Faculty of Economics? Okay. Uh, who is from uh, politics, um, development studies, international relations? Okay. And other faculties, what's, what's sociology. sociology? Okay, all right. <laughs> Engineering, maybe. <laughs> right, um, so this lecture is about theories of monetary policy. And um, it's very exciting, of course, because I'm not sure not many people know about monetary policy in general. Um, I will compare the neoclassical quantity theory of money with, um, and most specifically, the monetarist view of it, with the more recent modern monetary theory. Um, and this modern monetary theory, short MMT, has caused a lot of outrage in the academic sector because um, they've come up with proposals that challenged the basic assumptions about uh, we in mainstream economics. So um, people have accused them of being crazy, so we'll explore today if they actually are crazy. Um, as Ida said, I'll talk about uh, for about 30 minutes um, to have a, ensure we have a good discussion afterwards. And um, I will also oversimplify certain things about theory, so don't, please don't get upset. It's just for the sake of easiness and comprehensiveness. Um, I'll, encourage, I'll encourage you to read more from the suggested literature I'll give you in the end. Um, or if you have any specific questions, of course, we can clarify them afterwards. Right, so let's get started with the basics. What is monetary policy? Any ideas? I mean, we're all familiar with the subject. Um, it's essentially very easy. Monetary policy is a process of supplying money into the economy. And what this doesn't really say is actually the supply of money into the economy by a public authority, right? So the central bank, uh, maybe the Ministry of Finance, or some other institution that can bring it into the economy. And why is it relevant to understand it? Well, there have been lots of periods, uh, uh, lots of, like, some time um, back in the past, but also more recently, when monetary policy has gone very wrong. And one example that is often cited is the Weimar Republic, so Germany in the 1920s, when there was a massive hyperinflation, Germany inflated away its debt after the First World War. And you can see German children playing with money there. Um, but we also have the more recent example of Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe is accused of um, just printing money endlessly, uh, causing hyperinflation, running down the economy, and again, you see something that you rarely see, a child with lots of money, right? So the other side of monetary policy gone wrong is deflation. And I think that's actually more um, relevant these days because after 2007, we have seen pictures like this, right? You have um, in holiday homes in Spain, which are just abandoned and construction sites just completely empty because the investments have and the financing have been just gone out. You have um, social unrest in Greece because people couldn't pay their debt anymore. Um, and Greece as a country faced a sovereign debt crisis as well. So, and of course we talk about Japan, um, which has experienced a lost decade due to secular stagnation. And all of these phenomena are uh, connected to deflation, yet we don't really know, you know, it's a, it's a kind of an under-researched topic, so we don't really know yet what it is, and there still has to more to be done, and we can do this by looking into monetary policy and understanding it better. So, 
this is, those are the monetary policy paradigms we had in the past, um, more recent past. It started off with monetarism, which I'm going to present to you today briefly. In the 1970s and 80s, that was what central banks followed and believed in. Then from the 1990s to the 2000s, uh, New Keynesianism started to dominate central banking. And we have to, just for the economic students, basically, and for everyone else, of course, uh, monetarism and New Keynesianism, they agree with the goal of monetary policy, which is to reduce inflation. They just disagree on how to do it. Uh, and post-2007, we have an era of unconventional monetary policies. Uh, suddenly, Mark Carney, the, bank of the, gov the governor of the Bank of England, started talking about employment um, and, 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 and QE, so forcing investment, and repairing balance sheets. All, these, all these new terminology was adopted by central bank governors and central bank bankers around the world. So, the main question I would like to ask in this session is, what is the purpose of monetary policy? How, do have, how have different theories approached um, the, the purpose of monetary policy and what do we think about it? So we'll talk about this at the end as well. Monetarists have always said the money supply should rise in line with the desired level of inflation, which they say is about 2%. So you want a little bit of inflation, not too much. And MMT has said the money supply should increase to achieve full employment. So that's a huge difference, right? You have just like a monetary objective here. And on the other hand, you have a full employment objective. So I'm going to go, go through this step by step now. Uh, the economic students know this really well. This is like standard textbook economics uh, on monetary policy. Um, This basically is a beautiful graph which shows that money growth plus velocity of money. Oh, I should define it. Money growth means the stock of money in the econ economy. Velocity means um, the amount of exchanges in a given period of time equals total spending in the economy. Right? Most of you know this, I assume. Um, and if you manipulate this equation, you come up with money growth uh, with the money growth rate plus the money velocity growth rate equals GDP growth rate plus inflation levels. Rate. And monetarists, such as Friedman and Schwartz, they have done this long study about almost 100 years of monetary history in the United States, and they have found that most of these indicators in this equation are actually stable in the long run. And that accounts for the velocity and for the growth rate. So they have said this equals zero. And in turn, that means that the money growth rate equals inflation. So the more money we supply to the economy, the, more, the higher the levels of inflation. And Philip Kagan and other monetarists have done extensive works on this and show to prove there is a connection. The more money you give out to the economy, the higher the levels of inflation. Um, Edward Shaw and others then have conducted studies that show if governments do that, they tend to um, lose control. They just print more money and more money, like Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe or like the Germans in the Weimar Republic. They print endless money and the inflation just goes up unsustainably, leading to hyperinflation, causing the economy to collapse. Oops. So monetarists are really worried about inflation, right? They think that's the worst possible thing. And we have to remind ourselves that um, when they wrote this, this they, it, it was a really political issue to have inflation because scholars and politicians at the time thought inflation is the cause for most social unrest. Um, it was 1960s, uh, 1970s, when the oil price uh, fears of like an increasing oil price would would go around and then and eventually it happened in the early 70s and late 70s that the oil price shock really hit economies hard so inflation is a big deal and they wanted to f just control that to to have the economy stabilized now M mmt is a more recent theory is was um they came up with this i think in the mid 
mid, er, early mid 90s, they say we don't wor we're not so worried about inflation. We do think it's important, but we're actually more worried about unemployment. Um, so they're saying the state should be an employer of last resort. And now most people think that's crazy, but I put this picture up to show you. It's actually not that crazy because you can find it in House of Cards, this TV show. Um, I don't know who of you have watched it, but those who are not familiar with it, this TV show is basically about Frank Underwood, who's in, played by Kevin Spacey very brilliantly. He is a senator, wants to become president, and his big achievement during his presidency, presidency is this America Works program. He wants to put everyone in America to work uh, who's willing to work. And the, um, the interesting bit, which most people have, may have forgotten, is that he wants to get the financing for this program from a, from a disaster fund. So um, MNT says, nah, we don't, we don't need it from a disaster fund. We can have functional finance. So we do economics just a bit differently. And it's fairly easy. We have a US set treasury. And the US treasury has a treasury general account with the central bank. So why can't, this is the central bank, why can't the treasury just get money from the central bank for this ELR program, the Employer of Last Resort program? And, uh, and indeed, why not? Because um, they could, they, they could just account this TGA, this Treasury General Account, with more money um, and the Treasury could then spend it all into the economy. Now, of course, monetarists say, you crazy, this will cause inflation. And MMT says, well, yes, but we can tackle inflation by cutting non-ELR spending. So that's simple austerity. They would agree with monetarists on that front. But more importantly, and that's probably the better method, we can tackle inflation by rising, raising taxation. And this is the innovative, but also the most complicated part about MMT. So MMT says, basically says, we have, the state is not like any private household we have, um, and we can't compare ourselves to the state because we don't have a central bank, but the state does. And with the central bank, um, that means they can have, make expenditures before they actually have an income, right? We first need to go to work, we come home, and only we, if we get our paycheck, we can spend the money. MMT says, well, for a state, it's actually different because they don't have to wait for the taxes to come in. They can just go ahead, issue their own currency, and then whenever the um, money in the economy rises to sustainable levels, they can rise the taxation to ask the cash back into the Treasury General account and basically destroy the money they have created previously. I see one person nodding now. <laughs> I hope other people have gotten it. But we can talk about it later if there are any questions about this. So the important thing to remember is expenditures drive taxes, not the other way around. You have um, the tax year in the UK, I think, ends in April. So you get the state technically gets all the money from, peop from, from taxpayers in May, June. So they can't just always wait until they get all this money in May, June to spend their money. They will just say, OK, we calculate that we expect this much tax income and then we'll just spend money we create with the central bank in advance. So. The advantages of this approach are that you have a functional finance uh, approach, which sh says, well, you we don't only have fiscal policy, what the Keynesians always advocate, we also have monetary policy, what the monetarists uh, advocate, and we just put the two together, right? So we use the best of both worlds. And um, I quite like it because you move monetary policy out of the realm of money and just um, price stability into something that we've been doing ever since the crisis. So ever since 2007, people have already gone into the, into the realm of managing the economy through the central bank, right? Um, for, the, um, for the labor economists in the room, I think another advantage of, of MMT is to think about 
um, to, to realize that there is a public sector and the public sector employs um, workers, right? And they make their wages transparent to everyone. And this is what MMT's employer of last resort policy is doing as well. They just say, we need to expand this program and do it overall. Um, furthermore, the minimum wage, if you think about it, is a similar level of just trying to raise wages up to a basic level to say, um, this is, this is, um, you can't pay people less than that and basically interfere with the market, um, providing those people who are willing to work with a decent wage or uh, get employment with a decent wage. wage. Um, now, the Keynesians have, have been very critical of MMT, of all, although I think MMT actually perceives itself as pretty close to Keynesianism. And they've said, um, rightly so, that this applies to not many countries. It's actually, like theoretically, might be okay, but it's quite impractical because if you think about it, you need a fully floating uh, exchange rate. Your currency needs to be entirely independent of other currencies. Um, so it would because if you for example if you peg your currency to the US dollar as most developing countries do to ensure a certain price stability then you have to um, make sure that you can always convert your own currency into this other currency the US dollar or the euro or something and if you can't ensure that anymore because you could just keep on printing money then you're going to be in a lot of trouble and you basically have a situation like Greece or Spain. So um, most developing countries are excluded from the idea of MMT. They just simply can't do it. Um, another aspect is that you can also can't have much foreign borrowing because that means you have to repay money in another currency. And since you're not the issue of that currency, you just have to create, you know, you have to generate it from your own tax income. So uh, you can't have foreign borrowing and you have to have a fully floating exchange rate to adopt this proposal. And that doesn't apply to many countries in this world. Maybe the US uh, under, circumst under certain circumstances, even China, but that's it, right? So how the question arises, how useful is MNT for, for the average country, if there's such a thing? And um, another issue is, if you want to raise, raise taxation in order to tackle inflation, you have to make sure you can do this really promptly, right? Once inflation happens, you have to act fastly. But especially in a country like the US, this is a sensitive issue. You have to get people behind you and say, yeah, you know, we need to increase taxation to tackle inflation. Um, we need to increase taxation to tackle inflation. So. Um, get the majority for that. That's really hard in a democracy. Um, I think it's easier to decrease tax taxation. You would be most likely uh, find backing for that. But maybe, who knows, um, people would also argue this is unsustainable and you would have a lot of problems implementing this policy. Um, then a third question, which is very valid to ask, is if you adopt such an employer of last resort program, we're all pretty sure that it first it would ca cause um, inflation in the first period, but what happens afterwards? Because you probably s cut spending on welfare benefits. Yes, you have put most people into work. Um, MMT even argues those people um, who are on the street being criminal, they're taking back into work life so they won't be criminal, uh, and you save a lot of money on prison. So where does this money go? What happens to that? And Will there maybe be in more inflation or more deflation? So we actually have no idea. There, which basically shows we need to do much more research to um, understand causal effects of monetary policy with the wider economic agenda. Um, now, MMT doesn't only have economic limitations. They also have serious... Uh, political issues and that is first of all that the employer of last resort program uh, would increase labor costs and labor costs are already one of the highest uh, costs that businesses are facing 
So they would get really upset if they have to pay even more because the public sector all of a sudden starts employing the unemployment, unemployed people who serve as their reserve army. So um, with an overall level rise, um, wage level rising, they would have to pay higher wages and they, have to, um, they will have face more difficulties in finding good skilled laborers, right? The second point is inflation rates above 2%, which is more likely to happen. MMT is a bit more easy with how much inflation can rise in or not. This always upsets investors because as soon as inflation rises, the value of debt is eroding. And um, yeah, so basically everyone who is a borrower who has taken out a student loan, for example, uh, will find it very easy to repay because the money is not worth that much anymore. And investors don't get the money back they actually lend to you and they don't earn from lending from you. So they will get a bit pissed off. Um, and of course, MMT breaks with the assumptions of mainstream economics. And that's always upsetting economists and other academics, right? You can't. It's, uh, so the departments, um, are it's, uh, sometimes in itself, very political institutions. So once you break with the uh, with very um, orthodox or dogmatic assumptions, there's always a bit of a revolution going on, and people are very defensive of their own um, field of study. Yeah. Oops. So. The three takeaways I would like you um, to get out of this is uh, these. Basically, that monetary policy determines the amount of money supplied into the economy by public institutions. Very basic, but if you know that, you're already, you're already very well, well endowed with knowledge, I think. And uh, secondly, that MMT is a very innovative and like, yeah, a very positive, innovative theory, but it faces a lot of practical uh, limitations and we need to do much more research to solve them. And as long as we haven't solved them, we should be probably careful in just implementing policies as such straight away. So the bottom line of all of this is let's just do more research and discuss, right? Be open. Um, and I'm very curious to hear your input about uh, what is the purpose of monetary policy? Do you think it's okay to um, combine monetary policy with fiscal objects or with, ov with an overall agenda of economic policy to steer an, econo an, econ an economy into the right direction. Um, and then, of course, should we just print more money? Thank you. Here are the recommended readings. Yeah, we have two questions. How would the coordination work between, say, the U.S. Chair of the Federal Reserve with the Congress to raise taxes at the same time? This change, are they allowed to coordinate like that, uh, regardless of the feasibility of actually getting the tax increase passed in Congress? Mm. Is that even legal to coordinate across the Federal Reserve and Congress? Um, should I res collect questions or respond directly, or how do we do this? I, I can respond directly. I think we have enough time to. Um, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't know the legal requirements. But um, generally, from like an institutional perspective, uh, it, this mechanism of having the treasury borrowing, mo getting money from the central bank, and then just spending it on whatever they want is already in place. So that's how it works. Um, they, I think they have an allowance of five billion per day. If they go beyond that, they usually issue securities. What, that's what they call, when they call it, um, financing the deficit. Um, but this, they just do that not to mess with the uh, central bank policy. But in, in theory, they can just spend as much as they like. Yeah, but um, it's a good question to look up if Congress would actually be able to veto it, but it's one of the big obstacles to such a proposal. Yeah. 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 I mean, for 
for me, it is surprising because you are uh, talking about printing money as if it was the way money enters into the economy. Mm -hmm. Let's say gold, uh, legal money. No, today 99% or 95% of money is credit. And all yeah. of us, at least I mean businessmen, they spend before they earn. What? Credit. So uh, I would like to know the relationship of these ideas with credit money. And a second question, uh, have you read uh, what do you think about a Dirk Turner book? Uh, there between the table, I don't know if you have read, because he's proposing, you know, uh, Which one? A Dirk Turner's book, yeah. Dead and Devil. If you have a, a, an opinion about that, because he's saying things related with that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I haven't read Adair Turner's book in full. Uh, I think he's proposing helicopter money, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, helicopter money would be, would be QE for the people, for those people who, who are not familiar with the term. And that's a bit tricky because it wouldn't go, it could be used for consumption, so it's not insured, it actually goes into productive investment. Um, if, if you ask me what I personally would prefer if I had to advise a government, I would probably say that putting people to work is a more productive way of using resources rather than just handing out money and having it consumed and never you know, produce any, um, and, and any tax benefits and like further growth. On the first question, uh, which, is, which is a very good one, I fully agree that all, basically all money is credit, right? We have to, I've avoided this to topic in here because it's, um, it's very confusing and Jens, my colleague from the philosophy department has talked about this before. Um, yes, all money is credit, but not all money is created by banks. You have, um, so New Keynesians would argue that um, most money enters the economy by people making a applying for a loan at the banks, which is, which is entirely true. But actually, the largest chunk of money enters the economy through public finance. So that means the process I've just explained. And I think um, future research should address the relationship between endogenous and exogenous money, so money generated from within the market and um, money generated from the central bank. Ben. So I'm not an economist, but it seems to me that the purpose of monetary policy, as in pretty much all government policy, should be to promote the quality of lives of the state citizens. And the way it could best do that would be through promoting growth on the one hand and promoting employment on the other. And so I, I don't, it, and to me, it, it's that like inflation rates should be, you, you should you know, take, take them into account as far as they affect either growth or employment, but should be an end goal in and of themselves. So why is this level of 2% inflation so important to monetarists? Mm. Uh, just one question of clarification. Do you think that employment and growth are mutually exclusive? No, but, but, they, I, I, but they're not. I wouldn't want to equate them. I, yeah. I think they're related, but not the same thing. Oh, okay. So you're asking uh, why 2% well, inflation? Well, yeah, I guess, yeah, well, why, yes. Yeah. Um, I've asked myself the same thing. It's quite an arbitrary mm. number. I mean, maybe other people can... Um, other people who have more insight into this can, can contribute. But um, as far as I've seen, the, there are studies that show that 4% inflation, for example, wouldn't do much harm to the economy. Um, yet investors would feel the difference, right? So the people who lend out your money to the economy, uh, to, who lend out money to you or to your business, um, they would not get as much money back in interest and in the payment itself. So they don't like it. So, um, yet inflation is something that signals to people um, the economy is rising. There is a drive for investment. There is a drive for employment. So there is growth going on. And so it's generally a positive sign. But as monetarists say, you would always say not too much, just a tiny bit. But 2%, completely arbitrary number. Um, Philip Kagan, who has worked a lot of on, on, on hyperinflations, has defined that hyperinflations are at 50%. 50% 50 
So there's a huge gap, right? 2%, 50%, what's, what's okay? South Korea managed to develop um, within 30 years running consistently on levels of 15 to 25% of inflation. So as long as you can pay, you know, when you issue your credit, and as long as you can pay it back in tax payments and manage to keep the economy growing, I think it's no problem. I'm not an economist either, um, but I, I do struggle to understand definitional terms. When we talk about inflation, are we talking about money devaluing, in other words, it being 2% less next year than last year? Or are we talking about um, when the economy grows in terms of, in terms of goods? Now, Samuelson gives two definitions of GDP. Mm. One is a financial one, talking about money growth um, in terms of total amount of money and so he talks about GDP nominal and GDP real. Now, the definition, that stinks, but you know, if you want a confusion, that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. So when you say 2%, um, you say 2% inflation, does that imply that the money growth is 2% if velocity stays the same? Are we ignoring the fact that production and wealth, real wealth, are growing, or is that irrelevant? Or is that part of the definition of inflation? Lots of questions I'd like to yeah. sort out my confusion. <coughs> uh, yeah, the only thing that helps in this case, and I'm, I'm, I was equally confused as you are, is reading this terribly long book by Friedman and Schweitz. <laughs> um, so um, Friedman says this is in nominal terms, growth in nominal terms. Uh, and and in nominal compared, so velocity compared to growth in nominal terms remains stable. Um, and you're quite right. I mean, there there are very many flaws in there because this is if if you he compares it over a hundred years, and yes, over a hundred years you can see this quite stable and correlates with one another. But what about the short ter short term? Right, we're living right now, and we want a safe and stable economy next year. So if people this year decide to save a lot of money, this equation won't help us. Yeah. Sorry. So um, the <coughs> the like um, the motivation behind LMT would be to fund, let's say, an ELT program in the last resort. Yeah, but it's paid for, um, well, one of the reasons it works is because you then raise taxes, which means cutting spending on other things. Why can't we just cut spending on other things and use that money that we raise in taxes to put into an ELR program? Why do we need the central bank at all? Oh, you mean, you, oh, yeah, it, that's another way, right? That, but that would be the idea of um, people who promote um, the basic income, sort of. They just say, if you save all the welfare benefits, you can channel that money into paying people yeah. a basic income. It seems like you're already getting that benefit because you're taking away benefits from other areas. Yeah. Uh, it, it, would be, it would be interesting to actually do the math and find out how much extra spending we would need for like, such a full employment program. It might not be as much as, yeah, as we need, but I do think um, if you want to put everyone into work, and, and MT also suggests you should put them, you should train them. Like you should not only, you know, ask them to do very basic, simple work, the stuff. Uh, you should you should train them as well to make them fit and educated to enter the private sector, maybe eventually. Um, so, uh, just under the assumption that it does take a bit more money um, than we're currently spending on on. In, in the public sector already, it, it, yeah, it wouldn't be a problem to raise the financing from the central bank. It goes both ways. Yeah. Since MMT requires an independent currency, is it an argument against multinational currencies such as the euro? Um, mm, I haven't thought about that. Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, in that sense, I think MMTs would say the euro is like the gold standard, right? You have to ensure, Greece has to ensure convertibility of the drachma into euro. And if you can't ensure it, and if you, you know, you can't just print more money. Yeah. So 
So again, it goes back to the point of practical implications. Are we actually, can we do it in Europe? Certainly not, yeah. Good question. Any other insights, thoughts? Yeah. Just thinking that I don't know if monetarists are, <coughs> are as sort of just focused on inflation as you were saying, but I mean, I, th I thought the main message of Friedman and Schwarz's book was that um, the Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression by mm -hmm. like causing unemployment and deflation back into a tight monetary policy. And um, yep. like the Federal Reserve of America currently has a mandate for inflation and unemployment. So, I mean, it's just that in the like 70s and 80s when you were writing inflation, it was a big problem, but that doesn't mean that theoretically they are yeah. No, that's that's valid. Um, they do show how the Fed contracted monetary uh, policy, uh, had a very contractionary monetary policy, thereby causing uh, or making the Great Depression more severe, or, it, or even causing it. Um, and they also show how once the Fed um, expanded its monetary policy, things actually got much better and the recovery was on the way. Um, what is a bit, what stands a, get, a bit at odds uh, with this analysis, though, is the most recent crisis, I would argue, because um, there was a lot of monetary easing after the financial crisis, and it didn't help very much, right? You had, an, I think, monetary easing um, after the Great Depression kicked in in, like, 1931 or 1932. There's one uh, paper by Roma on this. Um, so that's pretty soon after the crash of 1929, right? But now um, we are still having problems um, in the Eurozone. The US is doing okay, but you know, it, it took much longer after the last crisis to recover, although there was massive ex monetary expansion. So the question is how much monetary expansion is really sufficient to do that? Like the EU had quite a lot less monetary expansion mm -hmm. than the UK and the US. And yes. It seems to have worse. So it's, it's, uh, it seems to be yeah. That's true. But also the US, which many people neglect, had um, the US had fiscal policies, right? They they were not doing what they preached. They just uh, once it was necessary, they just went in there and had a massive um, uh, fiscally expansionary program as well. So we don't know what actually is the cause of quick recovery, relatively quick recovery in the US. Yeah. Sorry, another question. Is it, isn't it the case that um, <coughs> um, I think Werner and Randall or people have been saying that the reason when the central bank prints all this extra money um, for, the, for the national banks of the country to, to spend they don't choose to spend it on production, they choose to spend it to, to make it available to people um, as loans, those people who have um, collateral, namely those people who are looking for assets, uh, and for, for expanding assets and for, hence the asset bubbles, so price rises in this country for housing, but no production. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a recipe for inflation, surely. Yeah. And, and however much you print, it's... Uh, it's not going to do anything if it goes into people who want to borrow it to invest in rising prices and instead of into productive uh, goods and services. Mm -hmm. So is that not a valid uh, criticism of the way in which it's being done? Yeah, I would, I would say so, yeah. Just a comment on what the McCreek has said. I, I think that actually the, uh, the inflation rule is embodiment of Friedman's idea of a uh, natural rate of unemployment. So he, he actually, I, if I'm correct, uh, he actually discarded the idea that employment matters at all for uh, monetary policy. And the, uh, in fact, you, you have mixed rules, so you also take employment into account. And I think w that's, that's not where it came from, but I mean recent uh, uh, theory inputs from New Keynesians was that 
it is because you have stickiness of wages and it kind of helps you uh, to get to the equilibrium, which is natural, so-called natural uh, rate of unemployment, and that's that's the origin. So that's more of a common than a question, mm -hmm. but that's the origin of the of the inflation. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you see any relationship between this approach, the, what can happen after that, with a socialist economy? If the state is the employer, last resort, of mm. course, it is the only one who can say, everyone can come to me and I will give you uh, a job mm -hmm. and I will pay with new money. But then you have to, relax, uh, to remember what has happened in the history. When the state tries to control everything from above, productivity, of course, these functions, if all the resources are employed in the best way, efficiently, if not, it is a disaster, an economic disaster, and probably also a political disaster. Uh, there has been any any author studying the implications, the political implications of that? Yeah, that's a valid point. Uh, I am myself from East Germany, so I know what happens if you uh, set up a social sh socialist order. It, it, it didn't work. Um, yeah, um, however, I think the general debate um, about economic policy, market versus um, social planning, um, is always is, is not realizing that we there you know there's a spectrum, and you can move on that spectrum, and and hopefully you can adjust. Um, there's n it's not either or you know, and Germany shows or the example of Germany shows there there is somewhat a third way uh, into that, and you or Scandinavian countries as well. You can ensure social welfare. You can um, and you know, still have a growing economy, a very stable one, too. Yes? Um, I'm just wondering, in, in the sort of employer class resort program, what, what exactly would the people be employed to do, and how would the government decide what to program, yeah. like how do you speak this case? Yeah, we, we would have to ask the MMT as that. I, I, would, I would agree, like, um, because I know from personal experience, um, that uh, in the East Germany, they employed people for no reason, right? Like just because they wanted to work, but they didn't actually contribute anything to, to the organization. They were just like there. So um, the question is really, can you give them a work where they actually contribute and uh, are productive? And that's very valid, right? What do you do if they just hang around and get money for nothing? You wouldn't want that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, if I can also kind of respond to both comments. Uh, so basically, it can it can be very productive with government. Just, I mean, you see whatever job goes, whatever you can, the government can think uh, of. But if you have industrial strategy and, for example, wants to develop some critical infrastructure and works with closely with business sector, develop some new industry. Then it might employ people in very specific direction which can contribute to kind of like longer term expansion of that sector, contribute to long term growth, and those people can also become the natural part of that industry. So that may kind of respond to that in a way, right? I don't I mean if in case in terms of infrastructure you can for example identify where you have like really crappy uh, highways or railroads and build that, those contribute massively also mm -hmm. to fighting unemployment. Uh, and the, the other the other comment that was made before was about how government control of, of this sector can kind of make a slippery slope into the, uh, uh, the government controlling everything, which is like a, mis a bit of misperfair, but we can say. But what Hayek was saying. However, when you, when you think about, for example, the market for healthcare that does not exist in many countries, it does not appear to be a problem. So it's rather, the, uh, in my opinion, the uh, uh, matter of perspective. If you consider that to be job security, to be human right, 
uh, it can, and that the people will democratically accept that, then it can work that way. If you don't accept it, it can work with the private sector. So I don't see a problem, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>